Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's uh, interesting. I was just asking Joe, when was the last time we gathered? And he told me it was November 2nd. Is that right? November 2nd? And boy, the world looked a lot different back on November 2nd, even after that. And um, boy, I'll be very honest, you know, it was a tough November for me personally. Anyone else have a tougher than expected November? Yeah. Um, long lines, machines going down, you know, frustrations abundant. Yeah, I mean, look, it was, it was interesting. I didn't just interesting, it was super frustrating uh, for a lot of us. And I know that as we continue to gather here, now in this new year, some of you are a little bit demoralized and maybe saying like, man, I'm looking for answers and all that. And I, I spent a lot of time praying and meditating on this uh, in December. And I, I know a lot of you came to our event, America Fest, and thank you for those of you that came. It was terrific. It was our largest event to date. It, the enemy wants us to give up. And part of why we continue to gather and we continue to have this night where we have open question and answer and some great experts is to get out of the house, is to be around people that are like-minded and go through the effort to say, I'm not giving up, I'm going to keep on learning, I'm going to keep on acting, and I'm going to continue to do the right thing even when it's difficult, even when it is harder than it needs to be. And Look, I mean, we, we need to be honest with both ourselves and with each other. Things probably should have gone a lot differently. Is that fair to say? Can I say that? And again, the essence of this gathering is not political, but you could tell a lot from elections, right? You could tell a lot from politics, and you can glean from it, and you can think about it. And I could say this, that so much of the work that you put in was not for, was not for nothing. There was a lot to celebrate and there was a lot to look at. But as we head into this next year, my challenge for all of you and for the church at large is we need to redouble our efforts in 2023. And I know some of you are saying, man, I'm just so exhausted. When do we get in our country back? We've got to fight harder. We've got to organize. We have to continue to educate ourselves on where we've come from, from our biblical tradition and from our history, understand what we're fighting, and also understand it's not all bad that there, and I, I said this the other day, um, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I think it's very interesting, because that's usually the best things that I say, right? Which is, I don't think that the world's elites are, they quite understand why the American people keep fighting. I mean, you, look at, you listen to what they said at Davos, the World Economic Forum, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, they don't understand why you love this country so much. They, tr they truly don't. They thought that they could get you to a place of forced and immediate demoralization. And yes, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to be less than thrilled. But what makes our country different and what has made us different is our refusal to surrender and instead say, you know what? Maybe it's God's plan for all of us that we didn't get everything that we wanted so that we wouldn't just celebrate endlessly and instead we'd get to work in a time where we really need to pour into our nation. Maybe that's what God is teaching us in this moment. Because the only way the bad guys win is if we give up, period. That's the only way that they win. And so my challenge for you this year, we have some amazing speakers already planned for you. Next month, we have the great Dennis Prager coming, and so make sure you get, you bring a friend or two as we talk about his rational Bible, one of the great pieces, one of the great accomplishments of Bible commentary in the modern era. So I encourage you to bring your friends to that. But we want to continue to keep this growing, and it's growing by every measure possible. I get, people come up to me all the time, they say, Charlie, the gatherings at Freedom Night in America, thanks to Dream City Church and the leadership of the Barnett family, it really keeps me going. It makes me want to run for school board. It makes me want to educate my kids around these values. It has opened up my eyes to what's really happening in the country. And for those of you that have never been to one of these gatherings before, since we're in a new year, let me tell you kind of why we do this. We do this for a lot of reasons, and Dream City deserves the credit for their courage and their willingness to host this. One of the reasons we do this is the American church has been silent and cowardly for far too long. And it was very funny, I had a pastor, and I, I struggle with patience. 
Um, it's not a fruit of the Spirit that comes easy to me, especially on this topic. I had a pastor that emailed me, and he said, uh, and he was sweet about it, and I, I took an hour to respond. Really, that was smart. Um, should have taken two hours. But he, um, he said, Charlie, I'm really undecided after the last couple years of whether or not I should speak out on current events. I said, okay, let me get this straight. So after the last year of the lockdowns of churches, strip clubs and marijuana dispensaries and liquor stores remain open, the forced vaccinations, the masks on our kids, the most suicidal generation and alcohol addicted and drug addicted generation in history, our border remains completely and totally wide open. They're raiding the homes of pro-life leaders. You're still undecided after that, after a couple years? Like, what more information do you need exactly to want to speak out? And so I, I worded it a little bit nicer than that. But see, that's, that's your word, nice, Jeff, there you go. Um, and basically he said, and he was said, I'm undecided of whether or not it's worth doing it. That's what he was undecided about. And that even made me more angry. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're undecided about whether it's the right time to do the right thing? And this is a pastor of a pretty major church. And I called him and we talked and I don't, I don't know how persuasive I was. But that shouldn't even be a question if you're a pastor in America. If you're still undecided at this point, and that really goes and it distills down. We have, we, have a, we have a really fun announcement. I don't know if you've read Eric Metaxas' new book, Letter to the American Church. It's fabulous. He was with us, I think, a year and a half ago. We are actually going to help produce the film version of Letter to the American Church to hopefully be, sc be screened at churches all across the country. Because, look, the church is the backbone of all of this. And I get, I first want to just encourage the people that are watching that are not part of the church world that are fighting for liberty because generally there are more secular people than Christians fighting for liberty and freedom in the political sphere right now. So that's simultaneously something that deserves their encouragement, but boy, the American church needs to look inwardly. And how many times have you heard, they're like, well, well you know, we, we, we don't do the political thing around here. And I, I I always, and we're going to talk about that with Jeff, is that, that means you don't do the right or wrong thing around here. You don't do the moral thing around here. Again, we're not asking you to be political. We're asking you to be biblical. We're asking you to be focused on truth with courage. And the enemy would love nothing more for the American church to remain silent and complicit and to be kind of in a position of constantly saying, we don't do that around here. Tyranny and totalitarianism will continue to grow if the American church does not stand. But honestly, part of why we're doing this is not just to talk the game, but to also to show that the church can host conversations like this, that pastors can be empowered, that you can have an open question and answer about this. How many different ministries do most churches have? You've got a men's ministry, you've got a women's ministry, a financial counseling ministry, prison ministry, parking cars ministry. You've got every type of ministry imaginable, right? And yet you don't have a ministry that says, you know what, we're going to talk about what's happening in the news cycle and what the Word of God has to say about that. And here, for any pastor that's watching that's un not convinced, if you are not offering biblical clarity to your congregation about how to think about the news of today, they'll find it from a secular source. We don't do that around here. Okay, then they're going to go to some secular, non-biblical source to go look at what's happening in the news. It's one of the reasons why I love Jack Hibbs. I know you guys love Jack Hibbs too, and he was here last year. It's why I love Steve Smotherman, who I think is going to be at the upcoming conference, right? It's what's happening in the news, what does the Bible have to say about it? In fact, the Bible's ahead of the news if you really read the Bible. It seems to be, actually knows what's going to happen next. And so we're in... I know a very perilous time, but let me tell you this, and this is the attitude I want all of you to have, because I had somebody the other day stop me and goes to this, and I'm not going to say who it is, they say, I go to Freedom Night, and I'm really demoralized and depressed. I said, that was okay for maybe a week. I was there with you. But we as Christians are not allowed to be in a permanent state of despair, period. In fact, we should be the opposite. We should be hopeful. We should be joyful. We should be solution-oriented. We should be talking about how things can be better and get better. I do not believe that America will benefit from angry Christians or from demoralized Christians. Now, trust me, I'm angry a lot. That's, that's hopefully little moments of time. The point is, is your attitude joyful? Is your attitude 
hopeful. And that's what we need to really make an intentional effort to do in 2023. We need to ask ourselves questions every time we gather. Are we increasing our ranks? Are we picking the necessary fights? Are we standing with courage? Are we learning something new every single day about the Bible, about the Word of God? Are we helping people that need help by speaking the truth to them? Are we educating a person that might not yet see what's really happening around them? If we do that, then we're going to see that fruit not just in 2024, but in 25 and 26 and 27, 28 and 29. That fruit will continue to happen. And remember, for those of you that might have been so demoralized, and I'm right there with you, sometimes those disappointing results can be lagging indicators of fights we did not have five or six or eight or ten years ago. In some ways, you're sowing the future of the fruit that you want to see. And regardless of all of that, the outcome should not determine your effort. Let me say that again. Your, the outcome should not determine your effort. Instead, you should be obedient to the truth, obedient to God, regardless of whether or not you get the outcome that you desire. <laughs> Obedience is more important because we are not here playing the gambling odds at Las Vegas. That's not, because I get these emails, Charlie, I'm done, I'm never getting involved, I'm, I just, everything's falling apart. And by the way, God bless you. Like, what? That's so strange. It's like, you obviously believe in a God who loves you. Your obedience to a God that loves you should continue regardless of whether or not things do not go the way you want them to go. And I can't think of a better guest to kick us off than the person we have tonight. Dr. Jeff Myers is the author of a fabulous book. It's The Truth Changes Everything, or Truth Changes Everything. He's going to do a book signing afterwards in the lobby. I had him on my show for a full hour today. He is incredibly learned, brilliant and bright, understands the complexity of this, but we're really going to explore one topic of the book that I think is really important, which is what happens to a society, a civilization, a generation, a people, a church, a community, a corporation, a company, if truth is not the ultimate value. This is more than an intellectual exercise. This is good versus evil. And we're going to explore that tonight. Join me in welcoming the first guest of 2023, Dr. Jeff Myers. Let's have some fun, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, Charlie. Hey, everybody. Happy New Year. You know, there's a great Seinfeld episode about that. Still getting Happy New Year in February. That's, uh, that's it something. It is February, isn't it? Huh? It is February. Yeah, it is. I guess so. It's February 1st. Oh, so, uh, Dr. Myers, welcome. Thank you. And I love this church. They're so close to me and close to Turning Point USA. They are a rarity. Do you have any initial comments on how churches need to stand right now before we get into your book? Only about 20% of the people who even go to church have a biblical worldview. It's hard to imagine, but if you, if you see in any given church a row of 10 people, two of them are there to figure out what God has to say and apply it to their life. The other eight are asking, well, does the pastor's story inspire me? Does his truth somehow match up with my truth? And as long as people who ought to know better are not seeking the truth, I can see why it's very discouraging for a lot of pastors. Uh, Two-thirds two of people who go to church, by the way, said they want their pastor to talk on current issues. Now, when pastors were asked, do you address current issues from the pulpit? Or they, they, said, they asked the question very cleverly. They said, do you think the Bible speaks to current issues? Yes. 90% of them said yes. Then they asked, one by one, which of these have you addressed from the pulpit? Only 10% of them had ever addressed any of the issues. So there's this big gap right now, and part of the gap is the meanness factor. Uh, basically, in a, the poll, now Summit Ministries is not a polling company, I'll tell a little bit about what we do, but we poll uh, in the United States of America every month because we wanna keep our finger on the pulse of where people are. Five to 8% of the people in this country are jerks. <laughs> That's. They're jerks. They hate you. They hate everything you stand for. They think that as a Christian, you should not have the right to speak out. They, they say, how do you solve conflicts with people? And their answer is, I cut them out of my life. I mean, that's, 
It's that kind of a thing, five to eight percent of the people. The rest of the people are so afraid of that, those yeah, that's right. that they stay quiet. It's one of the rare situations I've seen in my lifetime where a tiny, tiny little tail can wag the whole dog because we're so afraid of offending. And so that, that segues to your, your book, Truth Changes Everything. If you have the truth and you don't speak the truth, then what good is actually having the truth? Yeah, you can't, well, part of the problem is you can't really say that you have the truth if it's not a truth that you're willing to speak. You know, uh, I was recently reading a book by a, a very famous pers a political person from another country, and in the book he talked about the arc of history. You know, Martin Luther King said the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And his point was it does not automatically bend toward justice. People have to stand for justice. They have to know what justice is, and they have to actually say so, mm -hmm. which means that you court opposition. There are pe people who don't like you. Charlie, you, you've got to be the king of nasty, getting nasty grams in the email, right? I, I mean, I don't know anybody else who gets as many. I get them from my fans. <laughs> <laughs> you have a rough crowd. Uh, They're really intense, I got to tell you. I, I, I love you, all of you. I, I, I spoke at one of the events, and it was, it was hysterical because they were, they were, it was awesome. Yeah. There were thousands of them there. And then I said, I'm offering some breakout sessions, some workshops. They packed out the breakout sessions. They just wanted to learn so much. But uh, it was hours and hours and hours of conversation. You know what, the cur having curious people, even if you don't agree, isn't that a better world? Of course, and that, that actually ties into one of the themes I want to address about your book, which is one of the reasons why curiosity is dying, or at least entertaining other opinions is dying, is that the very same people who say that there is no absolute truth, in reality are willing to use a lot of power to shut you up from saying the truth. Is that it's inherently tyrannical, this idea that there is no truth. In fact, all they believe is in power dynamics at its, at its core. I think you're right, and, and, and my opinion on that doesn't really matter. Um, Peter M. Sorokin, who was the greatest sociologist, I think, in the history of America, the founder, I believe, of the sociology department, both the University of Minnesota and at Harvard University. He did a study of the sociology of all civilizations, and that was one of his dominant conclusions. In the absence of a belief in God, in the absence of moral absolutes, in the absence of those convictions, the only binding imperative left is power and physical force. So if you give up the idea of truth, then what you're, what you're left with, uh, as, as you mentioned before, is, is the Soviet Union. Yeah, so, but let's, let's play devil's advocate. Some people in the audience, I'm sure, hear this all the time from, you know, a young 19-year-old that believes they know everything. They say, but you're so judgy, and that's the, that's the scientific term, by the way, judgy. <laughs> it's, cl it's a clinical term, judgy. And I have my truth and you might have your truth, and we all have our own truth, so leave me alone, obviously unless you misgender somebody, and then I'll put you in prison, but we should all leave each other, we'll get to that later, but who are you to say that your truth is greater than my truth? This person might say that I have won the oppression Olympics because I'm a, you know, a lesbian in a wheelchair, or whatever, this, you know, wins the points that way, therefore I have my own truth. You think I'm kidding, but this is actually one of the, this is one of the arguments that is dominating our society, that if you're in a, an oppressed group, you somehow have access to a truth claim that white cisgendered males do not. Well, there was a lot there. <laughs> How about this? What is your opinion on judgy? <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing, it, this is, it, to me, it's funny because as a philosopher, weird things are funny. We're really nerdy about that. But when someone says there is no truth, they've just proclaimed the existence of a truth. That there is no truth. I had this debate with a professor when I was in college. He said, there are no absolute truths. And I asked him, are you sure? And he said, yes. So I leaned in, I said, are you absolutely sure? 
And he said, oh, you're a very clever young man. If I say there are no absolutes, that's an absolute statement. He said, all right, I'll revise my remarks. There is one absolute, which is this. There are no absolutes. And I just, I just said, well, okay, let's say that there's one absolute. Is it possible that there are two? And he said, no. And I just raised my hand. Are you sure? There's no, there's no philosophical basis. Somebody, somebody says, you're judgmental. Then the response to them, because if, if there's no truth, if we each have our own truth, then words don't have any meaning, right? So if somebody says, well, you're being judgmental, just say to them, what I hear you saying is that you are being judgmental. Because if there's no such thing as judgment, you wouldn't even point it out. In fact, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't have any kind of a conversation at all because it'd be like two people speaking two different languages. They cannot communicate with one another. And the societal breakdown happens on three levels. It happens on a personal level, or maybe we'd call it intrapersonal level. The, you know, M. Scott Peck in the 1970s agreed with a lot of the guy, what the guy said, disagreed with a lot, but he was very observant. He said, you cannot overcome mental illness unless you grapple with reality as it actually is. So we have these mental health crises. You mentioned this. 75% of young adults say they do not have a sense of purpose in life. 53% say they regularly struggle with anxiety and depression. We have the highest level of young adults today who don't even know what gender they are. Correct. And all of these things show us that you've got a generation that is failing to grapple with the reality as it actually exists. The second part is, yeah, the second part is even harder. How does somebody who can't grapple with reality relate to somebody else who can't grapple with reality? So it, what psychologists call attunement, our ability to just relate to one another, you cannot have that unless you have a shared understanding of reality. Then people who cannot relate to one another in interpersonal situations can't form a good society. The biggest issues with the Soviet Union were not the fact that they drove tanks through the streets and shot people, it's that people turned in their neighbors they actually ended up turning, uh, the, the government put such pressure on them that they turned on one another and they ruined their own country. It wasn't just the bullets. And in some ways, we're actually living through the experiment of what happens. And it's going to be a very brutal experiment. And this is where I'm trying to tell parents, especially that have teenagers, you got to be really careful about the types of ideas and language you allow in those formative years because most parents have no idea the philosophical differences that kids are basically lacing their language with. Sometimes I don't even know because they're on social media so much, which is if a 12 or 13 year old is protesting that, well, just live and let live and you can kind of determine your own life, that is a recipe for misery. It is. You have, the, again, I will repeat it. We are seeing the, the number, there's a lot of statistics you can make up. Tragically, you can't really make up suicide numbers. You just can't, okay? And so that number is the highest it's ever been in recorded history. We are the wealthiest country, we are the strongest country, and we have the most per capita people ever that want to kill themselves under the age of 25. It's a leading cause of death. Right? I, know, I know three people that tragically killed themselves since Christmas. I'm sure you guys know several. This, this should be, we should be having massive committee hearings on this in Congress. We should be having, you know, just, this should be the number one focus of why is it a country that has more of everything, has the most of your ambitious and kids that want to flourish, that don't want to be here anymore. And there's answers, I think, I think there's biochemical answer to this. I think the food doesn't help. I think there's all sorts of different things, but it, the, the, the underlying all of, of all of it is if you're 17 years old and you've been told that you have to come up with your own truth and that you're the most important person in the world and everything around you is racist and bigoted and misogynistic and awful and evil, then it does eventually lead to the question of, well, then why even exist? Yeah. At, at Summit Ministries, our main focus is equipping and supporting the rising generation to embrace God's truth and champion a biblical worldview. The core truth that has been lost and needs to be recovered in our time is that every human being has value because they bear the image of God, no matter their size, no matter their level of development. Young adults who've never been able to grasp that or internalize it, or they see it as, 
as just a, oh, well, that's, you know, that's speaking of the group. Uh, don't really see that. When, when students come to Summit Ministries, I, I have a whole, I've spent two hours with them on what a Christian worldview is. Not just what the Bible says, but how the Bible applies to everything else. It's like C.S. Lewis said, I, I, I believe that the sun has risen not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. So I, I spend two hours with them, and we will get to the place in Genesis chapter 1. You only have to read, you only have to open the Bible to the first book. And if you only ever read one thing and you read the first chapter, you will realize that every human being was made in God's and image. And it's, so I just, I, I have them stop, and I just say, I want you to hear what I'm saying right now. I'm not saying y'all are made in God's image. I'm not saying... Because I, I spent my career in Tennessee, so I can say this. I'm not saying that all y'all <laughs> bear God's image. I'm saying that you personally bear God's image. And I want you to get that into your heart. I've seen so many young adults come back from the brink when they get in their heart that God made them that way on purpose. They're not in the wrong body. They're not in the wrong family. They're not even in the wrong country. They're where God has designed them to be. And that, that right there is the most profound truth claim that the entire civilization is on. So when a pastor says to me, well, I don't want to be political, I say, well, then you don't believe Genesis 126 and 127. And they say, what do you mean? I say, either you believe that human beings are image bearers or you don't. I say, well, of course I believe it. I say, okay, then you do believe that then the political environment should respect that and human life matters and a million abortions a year is evil and cruel and wrong. And you do believe that a government should then recognize that every single person has a soul and they're not just a random accident of millions of years of Darwin Darwinian evolution. That's a political claim. And the church, what they end up, what these pastors end up clumsily saying is they say, well... I can't really see one party better than the other. At this point, they're so morally lost. I don't believe the church has really thought deeply about Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Immediately, the, the, your existence has purpose. If Genesis 1, 1 is true, every other miracle in the rest of the Bible can happen. You know, people say, oh, you really believe all these other miracles? I say the greatest miracle, even more than the resurrection, is Genesis 1, 1. It's existence. The fact that God can just speak the world into existence, that's, that's the... It starts with the great miracle. I mean, Jonah and the whale pales in comparison to designing DNA. I mean, that's, that's like small stuff. And so what I'm getting at, though, is that the idea that Genesis 126 and 127, the Soviet Union did not believe that. Mao's China did not believe that. Hitler certainly did not believe that. The American left does not believe that. That alone, if we isolate Genesis 126 and 127, which answers the question, what is a human being, why are you here, and is there anything special about you, all of a sudden that is incredibly instructive to how we govern ourselves. Yeah, I, I think you're right. The destruction, the level of destruction is, all, is so unreal that we have a hard time even calculating it. Right. Uh, you, if you look back at the 20th century, R.J. Rummel was a professor who had the grim task of trying to calculate how many people were killed under communism. And, and he finally concluded, it's somewhere between 150 and 360 million people who died at the hands of their own governments in the 20th century alone. To put that in perspective, he said, that's more than all other centuries of human existence put together. Right. What was the common thread of those societies? There is no God, therefore no human being has inherent value. It's all about the state. Can I tell you, I want to tell a story before we kind of wrap up that part of the discussion, because in the book, uh, I have a chapter on, so it's how Jesus' followers changed everything. They changed everything in science and art, and one of the chapters is politics. The other day, I was speaking to a group of teachers, and I said, okay, next we're going to talk about politics. They all groaned. They're like, oh, we're so tired of talking about politics. And I said, do you realize the fact that we can have this discussion is the legacy of Jesus' followers? So I took him back and I, I told the story of Samuel Rutherford. He was a Scottish pastor. He lived during the time of Charles II. So 30 seconds on British history. Charles I got his head cut off. Uh, there was the, in this revolution. Then Charles II came back. So he's very jealous of his power, really wary that someone might, you know, might uh, rebel. And this little pastor in, in Scotland wrote a book 
two words, the title's two words, and it's only six letters, Lex Rex. Lex Rex, which is Latin for law is king. The king is not the law. The law is the king. Now, the subtitle is 136 words. I won't give that to you. But in the book, he says, if you go back to the book of Genesis, you realize the king is indeed, as he claims, the heir of Adam. And so are all the rest of us. Right. Ooh, so King Charles, he was mad. I mean, he sent troops. Go up there, get Samuel Rutherford, bring him back to Parliament. We're going to give him a fair trial and then hang him. <laughs> that was his plan. Samuel Rutherford, rather rudely, died before the soldiers arrived. His final words were, I have been summoned by a higher authority. Which is a very Scottish way of saying, you know where you can put it. Right. And uh, it, it was, but the, but the horse was out of the barn. No longer could the king say he has this divine right. The people have it. And what did the founders of the United States do? They took Rutherford, they took John Locke, and they took a handful of others, Hugo Grotius and so, some others. And they said, the government does not give you your rights. At best, the government secures the rights that are given to you by God. Genesis 1 1, we are all, why we are here. Genesis 1 26, 1 27, what are you as a human being? Genesis 5, human equality. And here are the sons of Noah. We are all from the same lineage. Therefore, there is no hierarchical, there is no claim to a throne over others. The founders went specifically to Genesis 5 and they said, wait a second, this is the best argument for human equality we could ever have. Genesis 11 had to deal with power. God will not honor those that try to do big, majestic, and temporal things not in his name. Let me ask a question, though. I'm sure all of you have heard before religion has killed so many people and all of this. Raise your hand if you've heard this. They teach it in our schools. What you just said is 160 to 300 million people, more than the entire population before the 1900s. None of that was, quote-unquote, done in the name of God. Secular atheism has killed more people than any other ism in the history of humanity, period. It's not even close. And yet, if you send your kid to a government school, they'll say it's Christianity and the Crusades and the Inquisition. By the way, completely mistaught and misunderstood and misrepresented, but there is a definitely a propaganda campaign there. So let's talk about this and we'll do some questions. Do you have a thought yeah. on that? No, I, I completely agree. It, it, in fact, the evidence of it is, is so overwhelming uh, that it, there's no longer any question about this. There, I did write about this in a book called Understanding the Faith, where I talked about some of the some of the claims, because I had questions. Well, what about this? What about that? Isn't the God of the Old Testament, you know, pro-slavery, anti-woman, and anti-gay? You know, all of these kinds of questions. So I wrote about this, and it was kind of like a seminary education to write through it. But the claims against Christians have always been exaggerated. And, and, and what's, what's even more important to me is that Jesus, not everybody who claims the name of Jesus actually does the right thing. Have you noticed this? Uh, but, but there are people who believed not only that Jesus is the Savior, but that Jesus is the truth. They, they brought those claims together. And those were the ones who changed everything in, in the course of history. I mean, Rodney Stark, the historian, he was asked, well, you know, science came out through the Enlightenment, right? When people rejected God, science grew. So he just went back and looked at the founders of modern science. He said there are 52 individuals whose discoveries and inventions constitute the foundation of modern science. How many of them were atheists? One. One. Did you know that? Have you ever heard that before? Because I certainly hadn't. I went from a bachelor's degree to a master's degree to a doctoral degree. No one ever told me that. So you, you have to find good sources to be able to, to dig into this. And that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do at Summit Ministries. So let, let's close with this, then we'll do some questions. Uh, I think this is really applicable to some of the younger attendees and younger audience. What is the truth then? You say the truth, truth changes everything. What is it? Yeah. Truth is what really is. That there is a reality. This is how Jesus phrased it in John 8, 32. If you follow my teachings, you will know the truth and the truth will set you, what? Free. The truth sets you free. Think, think of all the things we need to be set free from in our time. 
People need to be set free from addiction. People need to be set free from feeling that their lives don't matter. People need to be set free from the idea that I just sit back and the government's going to do all the work. They will take care of me. There are a lot of things that we need to be set free from. But that word for truth is a Greek word, aletheia. It means reality. Jesus wasn't saying, if you follow my teachings, then you will know your truth. He wasn't saying, if you follow my teachings, then you'll, you, you'll feel better about yourself. He was saying, if you'll know reality. And some of you, I can see there are a lot of people in the audience who are about my age. Uh, you learn a lot about reality that's not very pretty as you go through your life. And you realize, man, there's a lot of hard stuff about reality. But the truth is you would rather know that it's hard and know that you have a savior who is a rescuer than to be disillusioned about what it actually is. And for people that, that say, I don't know where to find the truth, your approach at Summit is don't, don't be closed-minded to the belief that you know it, but be curious to try and find it. Be, seek, and you will find. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So the, the, Knock, and it will be Yeah, easy. what you're talking about, uh, Charlie came and spoke to our Summit Ministries. Very group. impressive young people. Uh, t two weeks. You just take two weeks, and during the summertime, come together in Colorado or in, uh, in Manitou Springs, Colorado. It's this little hippie town right at the foot of Pikes Peak. Or in Lookout Mountain, Georgia, in those two locations, for two weeks, where you bring all of your questions with you, you meet with top Christian thought leaders. We bring in professors who love Jesus, who are smarter than the students' college professors. So when the students meet their college professors, and the professor is an atheist, they're like, well, I just studied this summer with one of the top ten philosophers in the world, and he totally disagrees with you. I don't have to believe you. So when the students come into that program, we, we, I focus, I, just, I do four things, A, B, C, D, it's easier for me to remember, answers. Bring your list of questions, will help you find answers. It's okay to ask questions. Second B is biblical worldview. It's not just that we read the Bible for our own personal nourishment, it's that the Bible speaks to everything. C is the counterfeits. I was in a foreign country and a guy walked up to me and said, hey man, do you want to buy a real fake Rolex? It's like... Is it real or is it fake? You know, and I, I was all jet lagged. I just thought it was so funny. He didn't think it was funny at all. <laughs> what, he wanted me to, what he wanted to do was sell me a watch that looked like a $20,000 watch that was a $100 watch, okay? It still told time, but it was a fake. It diminished the value of, of watchness, if that's even a thing. Very risky if judgy is a thing, watchness is a there thing. But, it, but if, you, if, you, if you look at the counterfeits, then all of a sudden your experience at camp changes, okay? Everybody's been to camp. Uh, you feel close to God. You think, how did I ever get away from him? And you resolve that you'll live differently, and then you go home, and it, the feelings fade because feelings go up and down. That's the way feelings are. But if you learn to see the world differently, then everything that you see begins to reinforce the truth. That's the idea of studying the counterfeits, Okay? And the final thing is dialogue. You got to learn to talk to people you don't agree with. You just have to do it. You have to learn to have discussions with them in a way that makes sense to them, that where the two of you are not necessarily butting heads with one another, but walking side by side toward the truth. I'm telling you, if you have a young person, send them to Summit Ministries. It will bless them. And I, I'm a tough sell when it comes to programming for young people, as, as you can imagine. Let's line up for some questions here, guys. And please try to keep the question somewhat topical to the topic we're talking about. If you do get off the reservation, I, I will do my best to answer them. But, and make it a question, not a public service announcement for why you are running for uh, dog catcher or whatever. <laughs> yes, Which sir. I hope you are. Uh, if, it, um, if you are interested in the Summit program for 16 to 22-year-old students, you can find more information at summit.org. Slash Charlie. 
Yes. How about that? Summit.org slash Charlie. I think, I think I have a landing page. It kind of had a ring to it, so we went there with it. <laughs> but if you go there, uh, it'll also save you, I think, an 100 or some uh, quite a bit of money off of the registry. Yeah, I mean, and I get asked by parents all the time, Charlie, I want to, my kids, they're slipping and they're this and that. I, I don't know what to do. You send them there. It is a, I don't know if you worded it this way, but it's a boot camp for biblical values. Is that fair to say? I think it is. And I think the students, when they come out, it's a force multiplier yeah. for truth because they go into the military, into science, yes. into medicine, all these different areas. Uh, but 4% of young adults today have a biblical worldview. By the time they leave Summit, 85% have a biblical worldview. Amazing. So it's, it's uh, fun to watch. We'll start here. Dr. Myers, Charlie, thank you very much for doing what you do. We all appreciate it very, very much. My name is Kevin. I'm from Cave Creek, and I have this question. When approached by a person who says, well, that may be your truth, it's not my truth, what would be your comeback to that statement? Okay, um, and tell me your name again. My name is Kevin. Kevin. Uh, the first thing to do in that situation is to ask for a definition of the terms. When you use that word truth, I don't think it means what you think it means, okay? That's sort of what it's, it, but it is, it's just like that. What, what, when you use the word truth, what do you mean? Do you mean your perspective? Do you mean what actually exists? So you got to understand what they mean when they use the term truth. I was on a very um, progressive podcast the other day, uh, and I knew their audience. I knew, you know, I knew all of that, and it's fine. But he said, well, you know, we all have our own truth. And I said, maybe, maybe you could word it this way. We all have a perspective based on our life experiences about how we see truth. The truth itself doesn't change, but we can see it differently based on our life experiences, or we can be deceiving ourselves from seeing the truth. The first thing you have to do is get a definition of the terms. The second thing is, so I, I always have these steps in my mind. You identify the truth, you identify the lies, you refute the lies, and then you help the other person learn to talk about and, and relate to and move closer to the truth. Okay, those are, so you're always thinking of those things. Say, uh, and then I would just start using examples. How far do you want to go with this? I mean, if I say that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, are you going to say to me, well, that's your opinion? How far are you going to go with it? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't say that, but, you know, maybe moral facts. Okay, fine. And I used the example on the show today. Um, I'm going to make two statements. Statement A, it is good to care for abandoned puppies. Statement B, it is good to torture abandoned puppies. Is there a difference between those two statements? 100% of the time, people have said, yes. Well, how do you know there's a difference? If we each have our own truth and we define words for ourselves, how do you know there is even a difference between those two things? And, and that's what Charlie was saying earlier. How, oh, how, what's the spiral in totalitarianism? You forget the idea that human beings are made in the image of God, then you lose the ability to understand words. And those two things always fit together. Like um, in Rwanda, the, two, uh, the, the Hutu attacked the Tutsis. They started by calling them cockroaches. Uh, it, Hitler taught his people to call the Jews vermin, yeah. right? Um, we teach people, I'm, I mean, might as well be blunt about it. People are taught to refer to an unborn child as a product of conception or right. fetal tissue. Right. You de the, what you want to destroy, you first of all dehumanize. That's what ends up happening. As Michael Baum